Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 158. In this episode of Garden DC, we chat with Claudia Kusilis, author of Private Gardens of the Potomac and Chesapeake, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Northern Virginia, about garden design transformations. The plant profile is on pickerel weed, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with Dr. Alan Armitage, who returns to share the last word on plant pronunciations. This episode, we're joined by Claudia Kusilis. She is the author of Private Gardens of the Potomac and Chesapeake. Welcome, Claudia. Thanks you so much, Kathy. I'm glad to be with you. Great to have you and such a gorgeous book. I have it right in front of me and I'm looking at all the beautiful photos. But aside from writing it, did you also do the photography for it? No, absolutely not. And you're right. The photos really make the book. Um, The landscape architects uh, have all hired photographers to catch the gardens at their peak moment. They are from various different photographers who are expert in photographing landscapes. Yeah, because that is definitely, I think, the selling point of the book is just those beautiful photographs to dive into. And because we're a podcast, we'll just have to describe some of those images today, (laughs) right? Um, And describe some of those gardens. So our overall conversation is going to be about these beautiful private gardens and their transformations and how they came about. Uh, But first, let's talk a little bit about you, Claudia. So we like to ask our guests on the Garden DC podcast, were they born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb? Um, I have to say that I'm really more of a cook than a gardener, but I am very proud of myself for keeping alive a couple of aloe plants and um, a uh, oleander that my grandmother gave me years and years and years ago. So um, that's where uh, my plantsmanship is. Um, now I live in, in the city, and so my uh, gardening is very limited. And I like big swaths of things. And so I have, um, you know, just my front door yard is just all one plant. Um, I think the direction that I come from is more of a design uh, background. I uh, went to school for urban uh, planning and worked in urban planning and design for many years. So creating environments is really um, what I think I bring to the table. And of course, um, my background is more architecture and architectural history, but uh, you know, I also like looking at how these designers use plants Um, as structures, you know, trees and ground cover and creating a whole complete environment using the plants. Hmm. And so from your urban planning background, were you working in that field or did you go into writing or how, what brought you to the book? Uh, Well, um, I did work for many years as um, an urban planner um, in the DC area. And after I retired, I started writing books. The first one was about Montgomery County's Agricultural Reserve, which is a very unique um, landscape environment and a commercial environment and a cultural environment. And then, you know, doing this freelance writing work, I was um, connected with the publisher by uh, Eric Groff, who is a principal at OVS. And um, so he was kind enough to connect me to the publisher um, who uh, liked my design background and wanted to continue this series. It's the book is published by Schiffer and they have done Northern California and Southern California regional gardens. 
This, this Potomac and Chesapeake is the third one in the series. And we're also going to do um, South Florida and that'll be available in a couple of years. Hmm. That'll be interesting to compare and contrast those different versions. Oh yeah. And I'm familiar with Schiffer Publishing. They're based in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. That's right. And they do um, kind of specialty publications um, on, you know, very, like if you're an expert on a topic, you know, they're the publisher to go to. And they really do beautiful books. You mentioned the photography. And I have to say, you know, I would look at these photos on my screen and the computer and it was like, oh, that's a nice one. But I almost didn't recognize them when they were laid out in the book. It really, the layout and design of the book itself really captures the beauty of these gardens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Schiffer does such beautiful work. And if you are into, I think, any hobby ever, <laughs> like yes. from doll collecting to pottery to quilts, uh, they've probably done a Schiffer book, a beautiful hardback collector's edition all about whatever you collect or you're into. That's right. Yeah, they have a real um, specialty market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father, uh, who passed away a few years ago, had written books on World War II Panzer tanks, and they had published <laughs> his oh. his book on Panzer tanks as well. So that's how I knew know them a little bit through that, aside from the volumes of books I've purchased on other topics. But yeah, it's great to support a local uh, and independent publisher. That's right. That's right. So turning to the topic of the book itself, the private gardens of the Potomac and Chesapeake, uh, you're defining the region as Washington, D.C. and up the Chesapeake, correct? That's right. I think it, it's a much larger region than just the city. And, you know, the Chesapeake Bay watershed does reach all the way up north into Pennsylvania. But sort of um, the way we live here, I think, sort of culturally, you know, people think of the Eastern Shore as um, a place to get away to out in the suburbs. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm from Washington, but they really live in Virginia or Montgomery County in Maryland. And so it's it's part of that larger region. And it, it, the area really does have a character, an architectural character, a community character and a landscape character. And for those listeners outside of the Mid-Atlantic or the D.C. region, maybe we should define that a little bit and talk about some of the geography and our growing conditions here. Um, there are a couple of things that the designers told me and that I learned in doing the book. And we do have mild winters, um, but the challenge is, is I think the summers, which can be very wet and very hot. And so it's kind of this in-between um, area, like the mid-Atlantic, it's not quite north, it's not quite south. And so they have to deal with that, uh, you know, a, warm, a very warm summer, but still can be a cold winter. And that's kind of challenging. A lot of these properties are waterfront properties, you know, preserving the water quality in the Chesapeake Bay is very important. So the engineering that goes into some of the properties to manage water is very, very important. And But it's not only the waterfront properties that have to deal with that. There's a, a Washington, D.C. apartment building in here that has a very unique garden. Um, they had to meet the city's very particular water guidelines, how you mm. capture rainwater, how you hold it and filter it so it doesn't go rushing through and carry a lot of pollutants eventually out to the bay. So I think those are the two um, kind of um, climatic things that you're dealing with. And then there is a culture of certain types of plants and certain types of yards, um, like for example, um, there's a lot of wrought iron you'll, that you'll see in the historic communities of Alexandria and um, Capitol Hill and even in Northwest a little bit. There are certain plant, there are certain, like I mentioned my door yard and, you know, people have certain patterns of yards that they, they use here. So I think all of those things kind of 
um, appear in the designs, if not directly, kind of subtly as well. Hmm. And I think one of the best aspects of the book, aside from beautiful photos and your writing, is that there is a plant list at the end of each um, garden profile. And that is so helpful. But I also recognize that there are a lot of similar plants used or repetition between the gardens. Oh, yes, that's for sure. And even um, not only in the plants, but in some of the garden materials like Ipe wood and Corten steel and things like that. But you're right. And it's interesting that you said that because someone sent me an email this morning and said how much he liked having a plant list in the book. And there are certain go-to plants that, you know, if they work, why not use them? The challenge is using them um, to achieve what you want to on a particular site and um, to use them in a way that makes them, you know, in combination with other plants that makes them look a little bit fresh and different. And um, a lot of them are natives or native cultivars. What one of the designers told me the, the benefits of the native, it's not only kind of like, well, it's good to use native plants these days. They thrive and they look right, you know, because they're part of the natural environment here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and such a great plant palette to use as an example for the home gardener. And here's where we should say that the garden's that are portrayed in this book are all professionally designed by landscape architects or designers, but they are probably a little bit beyond the budget of, you know, your average home gardener. Yeah, that's definitely true. They are, um, they are extraordinary in that regard, but you know, they have to deal with some of the same things everybody does. Where am I going to put my garbage cans? If I, you know, if when I drive in the car and I get out, where am I walking? You know, they all have to sort of deal with the business end and then, which we all do. And then they also, I think, bring something to it, regardless of budget or space. How am I going to use this site? How am I going to live here? What do I want to look at? What do I want to see when I look out the windows? Where am I going to sit so that it's most comfortable for me? And think, and I think regardless of your budget or the size of your lot, those are things that you can uh, look at your own site critically and bring to any garden design. You don't have to do a grass front lawn and a, you know, a deck in the back with a grill. There are lots of design options that you can bring to any site. Hmm. And you, you made me laugh because uh, I just pulled in my recycle and garbage bins this morning. And no, I don't have a place for them. <laughs> so <laughs> These big blue things are just sitting out there. <laughs> that was one of the first things I did when um, we moved here is I put in a big Nandina that would hide <laughs> the garbage cans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some type of screening material. That's a that's a great idea. Um, so. Let's talk about some of the particular projects in the book and the lessons we can learn in their transformation. And maybe let's start with one of the, I would call it smaller space, urban spaces, which is the Chapman Stables in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. I, that's one of my favorite projects in the book. Um, Chapman Stables what, is a historic um, property in downtown D.C. It was a stable uh, where, you know, if you were, draw, let's say, coming into town, you could stable your horses while you went around and did your business. Or if you needed a carriage, you would go there and pick one up. Eventually, of course, it, Chapman Stables uh, moved with the times and became a garage. And then... Um, as the downtown around it changed, it became much more attractive as a residential property. And so it was renovated that way. And um, I think that the designer here, um, Kate Reese of Clinton and Reese, did some really clever things. Um, the one that I really like is when you go out on your balcony, it's like a three or four story brick building. And when you go out on your balcony, 
you are not you have of course a fantastic view of the city in front of you but on either side you're not looking at your neighbor's balcony because they put these little i don't know sky gardens you might even call them next to each balcony so they're really maxing out the space for landscape and it creates this beautiful garden up you know up on the third floor up in the sky and then the other thing they did that I really like is how they met the street. And I think that's something you have to consider in any environment. What are my neighbors doing? <laughs> and how do I fit in or differentiate myself? And so they kind of recreated that dooryard, a little yard um, uh, next to the side, between the sidewalk and the building, with a marked off with a wrought iron um, fence and gate, and planted. And and a lot of times, you know, when you walk around Washington, you'll see these dooryards. They're very casually planted, and every single one seems to be different. Nobody does what they want, but they kind of hang together because they're all behind these little wrought iron fences and they all have about the same space. And so that's what she did here. It's very formally set aside, but the planting within those dooryard gardens is very loose and very free. And it just fits in really nicely with the neighborhood and adds some nice green and color to um, that she's sharing with the street you know, the neighbors as people walk mm -hmm. by, as well as the people who live in the building. Mm. Yeah, and they are lower fencing, unless somebody think when we talk about wrought iron fencing, they're, you know, say in New Orleans, where they might be six or eight feet tall iron fencing, the iron fencing along the front walks here is more in the three foot range. Yes, that's a really good point. Yeah, maybe about hip height and completely open and, you know, you could step over it if you if you really <laughs> wanted to or vault That's over it. True. <laughs> but what's great about it is they are perfect as a plant support, um, those three foot high fencing and or edging along the front. So in the pictures here, she has the, I think it's Nepeta, the Catmint Walkers Low all along uh, the front sidewalk edging and kind of spilling through that wrought iron fence. Yeah, it's a lovely feature. Hmm. And you just brush by and you get that light scent and those beautiful flowers. So what a, a great touch. And then there are some elevated gardens, like the rooftop uh, garden with sedum and yarrow. Yes, um, because the rooftop garden is a very particular thing, right? You, um, you have limited depth to plant in and um, limited weight that the roof can handle. And so I think over time, um, you know, the designers have really figured out what works best in those. And actually, it's kind of interesting in the book because we have one of the first ones um, in Georgetown. Uh, what was it? 3303 Water Street in Georgetown that overlooks the Potomac. And that was one of the first rooftop gardens that was done. And the designer there told me, you know, she had to figure out a lot of stuff with the building engineer mm -hmm. and um, where she could plant something with deeper roots. And since the garden has been put in, they've even had to talk about maintenance. Like, you know, these things look like weeds or they look scraggly at a certain time of year. You don't pull them all out. They, they're they meant to do that. And so it's clearly been a learning curve. So you have the first one in the book and then you have an example of a really recent one. Um, and you can see how they've evolved over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's been over the stretch of about 15 or 20 years of, uh, green roofs and rooftop gardens have really evolved and come into their own. Yeah. Hmm. So in the foreword by Adrian Higgins, who most people in our region are familiar with as the former garden writer for the Washington Post, um, he says a couple clever things. And one of them is that he loves uh, that most of the gardens here provide for the pollinators and wildlife by having, you know, a rich palette of perennials. But then in essence, the gardens are for people. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah, I, um, I, I love that because the, the sense of, you know, 
native plants and planting for pollinators and the environment. I think that's really just designers using their tools really well and really in a very sophisticated way. They know what plants are going to do certain things in certain places. And I think that's part of becoming an expert gardener. Um, but the but of course, gardens are for people and the way they have um, value and the way they last is how they really um, function for us as places to, to live, to enjoy, to entertain, to find a little respite and some quiet. And I think that it's, um, I'm hopeful that more and more people will realize that Gardens, you know, can be very personal, very flexible, and that they're individual on your own yard, but they're also a community value as well. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree on that. And uh, he talks about there's a studied minimalism, but it doesn't negate the mystery and the revelation of these gardens. Um, even though they seem simplistic, some of them are formal or straight lined or pair back is another words he uses, but you know, they're actually complex when you're in them. Oh yeah. That's, that's the interesting thing. You know, you look at them and initially you might think, oh, well, yeah, just another concrete paver patio. But then you start to look at the relationship of the placement of that space in regard to the house. You know, there's a view out of the house a certain way. And the, you know, the, um, the edge planting along the neighbor's yards, you know, there's visibility, but privacy. Um, I think, you know, that's really the designer, the landscape designers bring so many things to these gardens, you know, their knowledge of the plants and what's going to work and achieve what they want to. Um, the engineering that it takes to, you know, drain the water and get the site to work properly. And then um, the sense of design, views, um, uh, proximity, what, what things lie next to each other, even sound, um, you know, putting a fountain in a pool, where can I hear that from? Scent, as you mentioned with the cat mint. So they're, they, they're working on so many levels. And I, I think that is what makes these gardens so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, Adrian kind of encapsulates it in the forward where he says, the designer is the center of the web of this garden and must not just be an artist, but an engineer, a hydrologist, an <laughs> ecologist, a horticulturist, and always a psychologist. So let's talk about the psychology part of uh, being a landscape architect or garden designer. And um, what did the designers tell you about their relationships and working with their clients? Well, um, one thing was funny, you know, they said, oh, yeah, everybody wants a low maintenance garden, but how you accomplish that, of course, and is there such a thing as a low maintenance garden? Every garden needs a little bit of attention, and that's part of their, um, their joy. They draw you out into them to engage. Um, but one of, the, one of the first things they always said was, you know, what is the client trying to accomplish here? Um, Jordan Loke in Annapolis did a, I'd say, I guess a downtown Annapolis house, you know, a very tight site. And he's dealing with a family that likes to entertain, that has two little boys who like to run around, but he's got a tight site. So he had to figure out that for his client. Um, Joan Honeyman of Jordan Honeyman, she did a garden that you might think is more kind of traditionally suburban, you know, kind of a, um, a bungalow house with a flower garden all around it. But the client here uh, is really an avid gardener. And so they worked very closely together to um, create this almost botanical garden that the owner is still adding plants to and still adjusting. And so that's more of a work in progress it's beautiful. It is, it is, you would say it is a show place, but it's also a workplace for this person who really loves gardens. Um, 
let's see one more example oh the garrett park house was interesting it's very elegant it's very modern um and it has this sort of very calm pool but you know they have grandchildren and the kids like to run around and so how are we going to accommodate um you know these different generational goals of what you want out of a garden mm -hmm. yeah i was just looking at the garrett park one because i'm familiar with that community as a um, kind of Victorian era streetcar or railroad town. There's still a commuter train. Uh, the Mark train still stops there. And most of it is period buildings, uh, you know, up through the 1930s usually. And the house on this lot had burned down. So they're basically starting with a blank slate. They did start with a blank slate. And, um, it's a it's a narrow lot, long narrow lot, and they they had a the designer, both the landscape designer and the architectural designer, had a sense of fitting into the community. So you know that's a very contemporary house, but you know it doesn't loom over the neighbors. It shares a setback with them. You know where the house starts in relationship to the street, uh, the driveway. I think they used like that um, that old fashioned two strips of concrete driveway with planting in between, you know, which is sort of an old fashioned way to do a driveway. And so, you know, that kind of conversation of fitting into the neighborhood was really nicely handled here. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the plant palette list for that house and it's a very short one. <laughs> it's, a very, it's very interesting that there's really only two types of shrubs, three types of grasses or ground covers, and it's mostly the trees that they planted. Yeah, I, you know, and it is, I mean, I think that sort of shows you what you can do with some rigorous design. There are two features I think are really unique in this house and this garden. Um, the first is that very traditional path to the front door from the sidewalk. And in the book, you can see the pavers as they're laid out. But as you go to the site, you don't necessarily see the path because of the way it's graded. The path reveals itself to you as you walk down it, which I think is such a beautiful fine point that they, um, you know, they, they took this very traditional thing of this, of the front walk and it reinterpreted it in a very elegant way. And likewise, they reinterpreted the front lawn. It is very low green ground cover, but it's not a lawn in your traditional sense. So it feels familiar, but it's definitely distinctive. Mm -hmm. And how did you locate or select the properties that are in this book? Well, I did have help um, from the publisher who is familiar with um, landscape designers in this area. And but mostly I, I, I called them up and I said, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we want to show. And they suggested gardens out of their portfolio that would fit. And um, we were lucky to find a really nice selection from like Chapman Stables, you know, a new apartment building to um, Apotheosis Farm out on the um, Eastern Shore, which is a much larger property and definitely not urban. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that you have some urban, some suburban, and then some very out there like Arnold, Maryland, and some that are sitting on the Chesapeake Bay or on tributaries. So they're way out in what people might have as a second home some right. in some cases or vacation home outside of the city yes yes um and it's interesting when they when you get out to those larger sites um the issues are similar but definitely different again how do we protect the chesapeake bay when we're on the water and how do you um you're just working on a larger site, but you still have to mod modulate all the spaces. You know, what's the view when I drive up in the car? Where do I enter the house? What's the view as I go through the house and out into the garden? Those are the same things that you deal with um, in any structure in a garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of integrating the garden with the home, I think one of the best uh, examples in the book is the one that's just called simply Suburban Residence. 
And <laughs> yeah. just as Washington, D.C. metro area, this is a Lila Fendrick Landscape Architects. That's right. And I actually had been able to visit the same landscape on a APLD, Professional Landscape Designers Tour, several years ago. So I had immediately recognized it because I took mm -hmm. so many photos when I was there. Um, it's just a beautiful, modern home with a very modern garden looking out, but it, it knits together so well from the inside to the outside. Yeah, it's in this sort of, I think, goes back to the, the psychology that you mentioned. The couple that lives here um, are bo both have home offices, and so they have clients coming to the house. And so they have two distinct entrances, one sor sort of more public and one more private for themselves. And then um, they have that thing that a lot of us have is that window well and on a lower floor and you're looking out into this like either brick or concrete window well. And I think Lila was really um, creative here and turned it into this, um, it's like a vitrine. It's like this little exhibit and she has a sculpture in there and um, uh, you know, surrounded by some greenery and it, it something that would have been a real challenge, oh gosh, maybe we put up curtains, has become this beautiful view where you would never expect to have a view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of staring at a blank wall, you're staring at this little cove, this little kind of private secret altar garden. That's right. That's a good way to put it. Hmm. So let's talk about uh, attention to detail. And when you're working with a landscape architect or designer, um, they're going to ask you about materials, colors, those sorts of things. Uh, were you able to talk to the clients themselves? I wasn't able to talk to the clients, um, but you're right about detail. And I think going back to um, Lyle Fendrick's design for the suburban house, you'll notice the fence begins, you know, at the bottom, it it has very wide kind of boards. And then as they move up, they get narrower and narrower and narrower, which really reflects the house's design. You know, it's very, it's a little bit broader and solid on the bottom. And as the house moves up, you have more and more fine horizontal lines. You know, I think that kind of detail is really um, what makes um, these gardens special. And um, it's, it's something that you can do in your own home. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily more expensive. It, it, it certainly can be and will be, but, um, it's also just, um, not doing the usual thing and mm -hmm. sitting there and looking at it and figuring it out. Hmm. And that board fence, we should say, for, because those who don't have the images in front of them, it's horizontal boards. That's um, right. Instead of upright vertical boards. So they're wide planks towards the bottom, going to a medium, to a very narrow slats. And then they kind of have a topper um, board on the top to make a flat edge. Um, instead of, uh, you know, our typical board fencing here kind of has that up, down, up, down. You know, some people will trim it flat, but most don't. That's right. Yeah, it's not your typical stockade fence. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say that I see these more, these type of uh, horizontal board fences in Western uh, gardens on the West Coast and also in more modern uses. But there's no reason they couldn't be used in, in any kind of garden. That's right. And this garden as well uses a lot of concrete, so a lot mm -hmm. of cast concrete um, uh, patio, and the footers to the fence are visible. It's just one long concrete line. Yes, that's a very modern detail, I think, letting the structure be present. And can you talk about the E. Paywood? So for those, uh, it's I-P-E. It's, it's a weird pronunciation for the spelling. <laughs> you might, yeah. might read it as Ipe Wood. Uh, so Ipe Wood is used by a lot of designers. And, and why do they choose that material? Um, it's sustainable. Um, I believe it comes from Brazil. 
and but nevertheless they tell me it's sustainable i guess because it can regenerate um and also of course it's an outdoor wood that will hold up um in you know in the weather and i guess you know and the price is reasonable it's not like a teak or something like that one of the designers mentioned to me that there is another local wood and i'm sorry i can't remember the name of it that is becoming an option along with the ipe wood mm -hmm. yeah because ipe is beautiful and like you said uh resilient and strong but uh, the sourcing um from south america that would make it a bit expensive right hmm. And so let's talk about some of the gardens in the book have discrete areas. Um, I don't know if we would call it a garden room. Some of them are hedged off. Some of them have like court and steel between them. But there's definitely transitions between the usage of each discrete area or separate location. Yeah, um, all of the gardens do that. And it's partially as we've been talking about in relationship to the house, you know, out the view, out the living room, patio, out the dining room or kitchen. But um, a lot, but the whole site design in, in, is considered as a single thing. Um, the space for the car, the space for entry. And then in the, in the back or around the side, depending on the lot, what do I want to be doing back there? Do I want to just look out on the pool or do, or should the pool be kind of to the side so that there's more garden space? Do I always want to be at the pool where it's going to be noisy and fun and splashing or do I want a nice quiet space to the side? And so um, I think that's a part of the skill of the landscape designer and the psychology of the garden, talking to the clients and seeing how they're going to live there. Um, you know, how do I create that on this site? I think that um, the Loc Crabtree House in Annapolis is another good example of that. Um, the client there said, you know, it's a young family, they want to entertain. And um, uh, the designer there incorporated a movie screen onto the wall so they could have movie night outside. And, um, you know, that's it's sort of this nice progression from the kitchen to the patio to this lawn and then the movie screen. And you can just see how it works in a very social way, hanging out, have, you know, eating, drinking and watching a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. You definitely can picture yourself right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, for our last garden example let's talk about the taylor residence and i believe that is also the cover shot of the book is from that yes. same residence and that's in falls church virginia and they have a typical suburban lot except for they got to buy the lot next door that's um, right. and expand the garden so they got very fortunate in that way but it is a beautiful garden it has um a huge plant palette um so let's talk about some of the things that they're offering it but it also does look like a typical suburban lot from the front yeah that's right that um joan huddyman told me that that house the the initial house the first lot um had a garden that had been done by a noted landscape architect in Washington whose name was Lester Albertson Collins. And, you know, but I think it had been done in like maybe the 50s or 60s. And um, it, it had shown some wear, but um, the particular part of that design was this pond. And so, uh, of course, it had worn over time and, and pond technology had changed too. So um, Joan worked with the client to renovate that pond and bring it back. And rather than making it just kind of like a rubber lined space of water, it's a much more um, natural environment that incorporates drainage and plants and creates um, habitat. And I think she told me like, 
pretty much like the trucks were pulling away and the birds were arriving on the day that it was planted. They really, you know, it really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say that any water element in a landscape automatically attracts wildlife. As soon as you get running water or moving water or anything reflective like that, the birds will come. Yeah. And because you mentioned, you know, they bought the lot next door, which gives them a lot more room to work on. Um, Joan sort of created lines and spaces through the site and each, and, you know, there are different environments. There's a more traditional lawn, but it, you know, then there's the bridge that leads over to the more loosely and wildly planted area. And so it all really um, is, is a giant composition that works. And then there's this beautiful little rock garden kind of area. It's a very carefully composed composition, but because the, the owner is a real avid gardener, it's the composition that's always changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the entire outside of the lot is what they call forest. So heavily treed all around. Um, so that's their edging. And then they also include a meadow with a berm, a bioretention wetland, um, a little vegetable beds, which I love to see that they're growing some vegetables and herbs as well. Yeah, it's a really lovely environment. It's like this little small personal botanic garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the design gardens you see don't have edibles in them. So I was happy to see that part. Yeah. Yeah. So how can our listeners contact you to find out more information? Um, I can give you my email. It's appetite at kousoulas, K-O-U-S-O-U-L-A-S dot com. Great. And I assume the book can be ordered on Amazon or anywhere books are available. That's right. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it directly from the publisher, which is Schiffer Publishing. Um, locally, it's also available at East City Books on Capitol Hill and at Politics and Prose. Thank you so much, Claudia. So for our wrap up, are there any final thoughts you have about a home gardener who might be contemplating a garden transformation and what they should be considering and what they should be looking out for. I think um, they should take your clue, a uh, clue about psychology and think about how they want to live on their site and then just kind of um, sketch and think and talk to uh, people who know plants and try, try it out. And I'm going to add on to that, Claudia, that they should get your book to, <laughs> to start some ideas, you know, popping in their head and also tour and visit as many other gardens as you can. Yeah, I, th I think those are both great ideas. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia, for sharing and letting us know a little bit of the background and some of the ideas in, in your book. Thank you so much, Kathy. I enjoyed being with you. Pickerel weed, plant profile. Pickerel weed, Pontedaria cordata, is a perennial plant that is used commonly in water gardens. It is hardy to USDA zones 3 to 10. The upright plants are a nice contrast to other aquatic plants that stay low on the pond surface, such as water lilies. It has long lasting flowers that are a blue purple color and grow on spikes taller than the surrounding foliage. The blooms are loved by pollinators and the flower seeds are eaten by birds. Dragonflies deposit eggs on the stems. The bright green leaves are shaped like a lance head. Pickerel weed is native from eastern Canada through South America. It is found in wetland areas and along the edges of lakes and ponds. It is used in retention ponds to filter the water and provide protection for wildlife. Plant it in a clay soil mix. It should be placed in full sun and submerged under several inches of water. 
Do not let it dry out, nor let the water level go higher than the base portion of the leaves. It can quickly form a small colony if you let it, so it's best to keep it in a large container. Pickerel weed is easy to propagate by digging up a clump and dividing it. It can also be started from seed. Pickerel weed, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, my little colony of Lycoris, also known as Naked Ladies, also known as Magic Lily, Resurrection Lily, Surprise Lily, and many other names have popped up in the garden this week. So lovely to see them return. They have a beautiful scent and even more beautiful flower. Over at the community garden, the zucchini are pumping out little squashes and I am looking up recipes every evening on Pinterest. And if you have a favorite zucchini recipe, please do share it with me. One offer I want to call your attention to is our frequent guest of our last word segment, Dr. Alan Armitage, is offering Garden DC listeners a discount for free domestic shipping when you order his books. And this offer is good through June of 2024. Just go to alanarmitage.net and that's A-L-L-A-N A-R-M-I-T-A-G-E dot net, Alan Armitage, and simply enter the code last word, no spaces or dashes or anything, all caps, last word at checkout. And we'll share that discount in the show notes as well. Some upcoming local gardening events that you might want to attend include an online Zoom session on Tuesday, August 22nd from 12 noon to 1 p.m. And this is with the Friends of the National Arboretum and it is entitled Herb Garden Goodies. Dig in with curator Christine Moore and gardener Aaron Holden as they share their favorite plants that grow in the National Herb Garden at the U.S. National Arboretum. And then happening in person at the American Horticultural Society's River Farm headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, is a River Farm Anniversary Picnic. And this is on Thursday, August 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. It is free and open to the public. They ask you to make registrations via Eventbrite. Um, So check that out. There will be live music and you are welcome to picnic on the grounds. And then finally, Oak Spring Garden is open this fall, and that is the home and gardens of the late Bunny Melon. And so you get an opportunity to tour and see the transition of the garden from summer into fall on Friday, September 22nd and Saturday, September 23rd. Um, Tickets for that are $50 and you will go to the Oak Spring website to sign up for that and pay for your advanced tickets. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jentz. 
Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. Well, good day, everybody. It's Dr. A back in the garden and sharing with you the last word on just some fun things that we do in the garden. And today I want to talk about something that yeah, every now and then uh, bothers me. It's when people try to correct pronunciation of botanical names. Now, botanical names are difficult enough for many of us. Uh, whether I say clematis or clematis is no different on whether I say tomato or tomato. I, I understand that some people like to get it right if there is such a thing. And there are books and booklets on plant pronunciation. But for most of us, we have other things to worry about. We've got deer and weeds and critters and diseases. And how I pronounce my clematis really doesn't seem to be a really important thing in the mind of my garden. So... If you really want to learn how to pronounce a name, I guess, correctly, well, one of the places you can go is to the American Horticultural Society, a fabulous society. Their, their magazine called The American Gardener often has plant pronunciation guidelines in the back of the issue. If you wish to do that, have fun. But for me, I have just one thing to say to people who wonder how to pronounce a name. That is, get the syllables in the right order and fire away. And that is all we need to do. Have fun, stay well, keep your fingernails dirty, and see you in the garden. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.